I leaned really hard into mindset, really hard. And it became one of those things where I think it was the differentiator that my team needed to keep going at a time that was fully uncertain Mm -hmm. and people were starting to leave the industry. And so by leaning into mindset, it allowed me to feel better about things I couldn't control because I knew I could control what was going on in my head. Oh, attitude, you yeah. know, it's totally. what, what is your attitude? If, if your attitude is your, oh, this stinks. I can't yeah. do anything. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to accomplish anything. You're not going to do anything. If your if your mindset is, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to win this day. I'm going to, I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to, you know, move forward and yep. win. There's a good chance that'll happen. Totally agree. Welcome to the podcast dedicated to real estate, insurance, and everything in between. Join us as we take you along our own brokerage building journeys with additional wisdom from our network of business experts. Welcome to Bricks and Risk. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Bricks and Risk. I'm Tim Garrity. And I'm Sean Mooney. Today, Sean, we have an incredible guest, friend of mine, real estate superstar, hmm. Elizabeth Convery. How are you doing, Liz? Good. How are you? Hey, what Liz. A nice you. Welcome to the show. Doing great. Thank you for Come being on, on today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So a little background on Liz, associate broker and team lead for Very Real Estate, which is powered by Compass. She's also a real estate coach at The Confident Agent, which is focused on helping women in real estate, which we're going to get into a little bit today. Um, So Elizabeth is a coach, speaker, mentor, Navy wife, mom of two small children, super impressive, and an associate broker and team lead, as we mentioned. She consistently ranks as a top producer year after year, but her passion is coaching women in real estate. In October 2023, she launched The Confident Agent, a system for growth and success for women in real estate to help more women design the life of their dreams using real estate sales to fuel it. So she's currently living in Washington, D.C. on assignment with your husband in the Navy. Beat Army. Only for a couple years, then you come back to Philly, right? (laughs) I will be back. I will be back as soon as this is over. Awesome. Uh, She built a boutique real estate brokerage from scratch. We'll get into some of that as well. Uh, She was an associate prior to that in commercial real estate at JLL in New York City. She went to St. Joe's for undergrad. Go Hawks. Cornell for grad. What's our mascot? Hawk will never die. (laughs) And she's a great (laughs) networker and just a genuinely nice person. So, all right, first question. So before 2013, you had a background in commercial real estate, namely hotels. You also hold a master's degree in hospitality from Cornell. Did your hospitality background have anything to do with why you pivoted? into residential real estate? Yeah, really good question. Um, So I had been in commercial my entire career since graduating from St. Joe's. Um, I started in commercial appraisal. I don't know if you know that. Started in commercial appraisal. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's cool. Traveled all over the country appraising everything from uh, gas stations was where I started. They gave me all the bad assignments. um, (laughs) Talk about grinding. Oh yeah, classy. So traveled all over the country, gas station. Then I moved up to fast food restaurants. And then um, before I left there, I was um, appraising luxury resorts, which is kind of how I led into hospitality. That's like a very linear move there. Gas stations, (laughs) fast food, luxury hotels, Sunoco, McDonald's. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting. So I wanted to go back and get a master's degree um, because I ultimately wanted to teach, which is ironic that now I'm a coach and I have an online course. Um, I sort of knew I wanted to do something in this realm in my 20s. And to be an adjunct professor, I learned you have to have a master's degree. And so my undergrad was in finance and economics. I went back to school. Uh, I didn't want to do more another kind of finance MBA track. but I loved hospitality because my background was, I was traveling all the time. I was on the road living in hotels. And so when I went back to school, um, I married kind of real estate and hospitality and was working at JLL selling hotels. But the pivot really came because 
I found that I was not connecting with my work. I'm an old millennial um, in that I'm 41. So that's kind of the early stages of the millennial generation. We're, but we're, what millennial... we're Gen X, right? I don't know. We um, are. We're Gen X. 1980. 1980 is yeah, the we're, cutoff. We're 79 boys. So we're only about yeah. a month apart. So there you go. So these kind of older millennials, the millennial generation, um, I read and I found this to really resonate with me that the millennials like to connect with their work. And I wasn't connecting with my work selling hotels. I was really just kind of making everybody rich and that's fine. But for me, it wasn't where I wanted to be. So that's why I made the pivot into residential real estate. And I layered in the hospitality with that when I started my brokerage, because in 2013, experiential sales were not a thing, right? As they are now. Everybody's sure. about the experience of doing anything. Can but you in talk 2013, about that? I'm, yeah. that's, that's new to me. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. So experiential sales is really how do people walk away from that? Let's apply it to real estate. How do they walk away from buying or selling that house feeling? What did it look like? Sure. You know, everybody knows the process to sell a house, the yep. steps, but really layering in that care. You know, you think about yep. you go to a hotel. What do people do? Yeah. The entire staff there is Mint there on to pillow. Happy. That's a nice touch. Yeah. They're there to make the you happy. They're there to make you feel welcome. Yeah, the one that's in a rose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's what that's right. how my hospitality background played into my brokerage. That's cool. I love that you mentioned that because think about the different places we've all stayed in hotels. Now you get what you pay for. So you're you're paying a hundred a night. You're not going to get very much in today's world. Paying four or five hundred a night. I mean, it should be experiential. It should be top notch. They, they mm -hmm. should know you by name. They should ask what you need. They should say, have a great day. Is there anything you we can do to help you? And it's so cool you mentioned that because I feel like, like we've known each other for a while now because just through networking events, like friends of friends. And, you know, we were always on the same page. Like we both started independent mm -hmm. brokerages, probably because of this kind of stuff. Like when we got in, no one was like this. Like mm -hmm. it was about deals. It was about volume. Like who's number one, who's the biggest mega team. Like, and I know it still exists today, but it's funny. I saw this post the other day on Instagram. I think it was from Sharon, who's, who's the president of real. And he said, bragging is not marketing. And I, I was like, I just like clapped because I'm like, yeah. now again, we want to tell people we're credible. We want to tell people we're good at what we do. Like this is part of your track record is part of the reason why people will want to work with you. But again, if someone meets Liz and she has this experience that's different than everyone else, you know, back then, like treating people right, like introducing the people early on, Hey, you need this, you need that, you know, amazing closing gift, like great communication. Like a lot of that stuff didn't, when we first got in this business, it was about deals. Well, let me say something too, because when you, to take it back to the hotel and the experience, what, what my first thought was is that nobody leaves that resort hotel saying, oh, that, that dinner last night was really good. It wasn't about the food, sure. the things that they remember, the things that they take away from that stay are all of the non-tangible things. It's like, how are they welcomed at the, at the front desk? Yep. You know, how are they treated, right? How easy was checkout? Yeah. Like simple things. The, the things that you can't really, you know, put in place or quantify. quantify. Yeah, yeah. It's, those are the, the lasting effects that you have with a client. And I think probably, so as me not understanding what you're talking about as this experiential is like, that's kind of what, what I would kind of tie it to. That's exactly right. And if you think about building a referral based book of business, which yeah. is what people in real estate sales, usually that's what they want to do because yeah. a referral based book of business grows like a tree. Yeah. So if your client has a phenomenal experience, that is all of those things. It's memorable. It's lasting. It's all the little pieces that when they get to the closing table, they don't just say bye to you, right? You are still that partner for them throughout the lifestyle of living wherever they are. Yep. They then tell so many people True. and your business grows like a tree. And it That's really, true. the core of it comes down to 
making f- people feel worthy and making them feel special. And really that I think is the difference. You know, it's not the transaction. Everybody's going to get to the closing table, but how is that client going to look at that overall experience? And that's what an experiential shale does. I love that. Well, the other thing so too, is remember that the book that I gave you about like water boiling. The one degree. One what was degree. Called? What was it called? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Forget the name. The book I gave you that I don't even remember the name of that I supposedly Great read. Book. Great but, book. <laughs> but, Fantastic. But the, the point of the book is yeah. that it doesn't take much to be that much different, but that little bit of difference yeah. makes a huge Blow impact. Blow the whole thing up. Yep. Yep. If for bad or worse. For bad or for worse. Or just for bad or worse. For bad, for good or for better. For better or worse. Or worse. Hey, yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great point. Um, all right. So let's jump into the confident agent. So you chose to kind of take yourself out of production. You know, I'm not sure mm-hmm. if you're fully out, but obviously building a coaching business, having it being very niche, like it is helping women in real estate. I mean, it, it takes a ton of your time. Being a, a, a wife of someone in the Navy and the mother of two takes a ton of your time. So what was it about, you know, that next step you had said at Cornell, you know, you're learning and you're, you're upping your game. You might want to teach like what made you do the confident agent at like this stage in your career? Yeah. So I, um, I pulled myself out of the day-to-day sales. We'll back up. I pulled myself out of the day-to-day sales probably in 22 ish timeframe. Okay. It took a couple years to lay the foundation to be able to do that. Right. And last year I always laugh. I sold five houses in 2023 just because I think it makes me a better coach, yep. right. To be able to still be in the market and understand sort of what I'm doing. Um, I, turned 40 last year and my business also turned 10 years old last year. So 20, and I had a baby last year. So 2023 Congrats was a really big year all three. for me. Thank you. A couple yeah. things going and on. And I started Just kind of thinking like, what do I want to do for the next stage of my career? Um, not dissimilar to what I did when I started very in 2013, I kind of went, I was turning 30 that year. Like, what do I want to be for the next 10 years? I don't think I can ever think longer than five to 10 years out. Um, cause too many things change. But so I started thinking like, what do I love? What am I really good at? And how, how can I devote this next decade to something bigger than me? Right. I've, I've been very fortunate to build a business that has given me so much flexibility in my life. Right. Like I live in Washington, DC, my yeah. business is in Philadelphia. I have a team that helps me run it. You know, I designed all of that and put in the work to do it. So when I thought about it, I thought, can I show more women that they can do the same thing, that they can design the life that they want to be anything that they want. Awesome. And so the word that kept coming to me was impact. Impact was the theme of the decade. So I thought, how can I impact more women without growing my team? I didn't want to grow my team. I had done this to help the, the people on my team design their lives. And so that's what sort of led me to do a lot of exploring And I hired a coach to help me because I have no, I mean, I think coaches, I am a coach. I have two coaches. I think it's so important to have advisors to help you along your path. And I realized in order to impact on a larger scale, I had to create something that was bigger than me. Right. And it wasn't just based in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And so I got the idea to do an online course with a coaching component and a community. And that's how the confident agent started. I actually interviewed over 50 women last summer to ask them about their experience in real estate, you know, early stage career. What kind of training are you going through? What podcasts are you listening to? What books are you reading? Bricks and risk. What else would I listen to? Came up so many times. Yeah, Yeah. I'm sure. (laughs) And from all that data and all that research, I saw where the holes were in coaching and I saw a pattern of why I think the stat is something crazy, like 87% of realtors leave the business in the first two years. And I started to see why that was right. And the things that people needed and women, I think have a particularly different way of approaching building a business. They don't Mm -hmm. always look at it like building a business. They look at it as something that they do in addition to everything. I work for such and such company and I'm a realtor and I show up and I get training and it's not, 
It's not like no, that at it's all. It's not. It's not like that at all. Like you are an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you're a businesswoman, you've got to lay the foundation that way. And so that's how the confident agent came about. Very cool. So when you were talking to everyone, so you, you did a ton of due diligence, which I think is awesome. It's really good advice for anyone, you know, before just jumping right in and starting a business, you were seasoned, you know, you have a master's degree, you started your own brokerage, but yet you still took the time to talk to a lot of different people about what you were doing, your target audience, women. So how'd you come up with the name? Did it come through conversations with the women or did you say, Hey, I just want people to feel more confident. Like how'd the name come to be? Yeah. So I will say before we dive into that, Tim, I am so glad I did that research. I'm so glad because what I thought I was going to build was something totally different wow. than what I actually built. Good advice. Right. And I think that's where you can get into a lot of trouble. Like you can hand people what you think they need, or you can ask them what they really need. So that, that was one. The name came about because the common theme that I heard two things that I heard from everyone, almost everyone in these 50 plus conversations was, I just don't feel confident when I stand up and talk about the market. I just don't feel confident when I go on a listing presentation. I'm really insecure about this, right? So that played into it um, and really was one of the main themes of the confident agent. The second thing that I heard consistently, which plays also into confidence, I feel like I'm the only one who's going through this. I go into the office and I see all these agents and they're yeah. so successful. And I feel like I'm the only one who has an issue. And I'm like, no, <laughs> there's 49 other people I've talked to, You're but like, the same me issue. Me too. We and all, so we all how... have those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Did anyone, did someone encourage you as you were building this business? Did you have a mentor? Did you have a guide? Did you have a coach that was saying like, hey, I think you should maybe consider this as a way you know, before starting it, like go out, ask for some feedback, ask questions, figure out what people want. Um, yeah. did, did anyone encourage you to that? Or was that just, Hey, you're like, I think this is a good thing to do. No. So someone did encourage me. So I awesome. have a business coach who I've had for years. She's fabulous. She really was the one who helped me step out of the day-to-day -day sales of my business. Um, and her name is Sherry. And so I was talking to Sherry and I said, I want to build an online course, but I really have no idea how to do that. And she said, I'm guessing that there's somebody who can help you. Why don't you do some searching and see if there is somebody you can hire who can teach you how to do this. Wow. And it was great advice because I think so often, and I did this a lot when I started my brokerage and Tim, maybe you can relate to this. I bootstrapped so much of it because I was in the early days. Same. I didn't have money. Like I just kind of figured it out along the way. And so I think my growth took longer because I was figuring it out as I was going. Totally. I was fortunate that I was in a different position 10 years into being a business owner, that I found a coach who I hired, who specializes in putting thought leaders on a national stage. And so through the process um, that I went through, I had to niche down my experience right to that dot of who I can help and how I can help them and where I can help them when they're on their journey. And that's where the niche happened, but then the research was the next step. Well, cool. I think too, um, you could have gone into it saying, this is what people need. This mm -hmm. is where I'm going to coach people, right? And that could have been one way you went about it. And you could have done that and may or may not have been successful. Well, you kind of went at it in a different, almost the exact opposite way is to say, what do realtors need help with? What yeah. do women in business need help with? And, and where can I position myself to help them? You yeah. know, because you've done it before. You've built teams, you've built business. And so I think that that's amazing. But, but also too is, if you're finding people that are saying the same things, that's another way to build community, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's how, how can I uh, tie all of these women together that are going through the same struggles that are finding the same problems that, you know, I can have these people talk about that scenario and, Oh, and these women over here that have done it and been successful with these issues can kind of, engage with these other ones. And so I think it's an amazing idea and kudos to you for, for building Thank that you. out and, and having the success that you've had. 
it has been remarkable, I have to share, to watch the women in the program um, support one another in a yeah. way that they not only feel like they're not alone, but mm -hmm. they rely on each other for that feedback, for that experience awesome. share, for that I've got your back. Um, and that's what helps to build the confidence, right? That you know yeah. that you're not standing alone oh, yeah. in your struggles. Oh, Vicky and just did it. I know I can do it, right? She yeah. just, she's been going through the same things and she was able to overcome it. She was able to do this. Mm -hmm. Why can't I, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's so good. Um, all right, let's shift a little bit because I'd love to talk about before the confident agent, you know, you started your own brokerage from scratch as did I. So like when you and I met, like we were fresh, like we were like, Oh my gosh, Tim, we were bootstrapping together. We had, we had these like, brands we We're like, screw everyone. Like we're going to do whatever the hell we want to do. And we're going to treat people right. And it's customer service and it's referrals. And like, now you wake up, you know, 2024, a lot of the market is like that now. So I don't want to say we were like the pioneers because again, people were doing it before us, but I will tell you, cause I recently had a shift in my business. As you know, mm -hmm. had a partnership Copper Hill for almost 10 years, the partnership ended. So we had to sunset the brand really allowed me to step back and be like, what are the things that I love about what I've been doing like the last 10 years? One was practicing. I, I've never stopped. So again, we're mostly by referral. I do a little bit of lead gen through my networking and stuff like that, but overall it's mostly referral. And um, it also allowed me to step back and say, I don't necessarily need that company or that brand to keep moving forward down my path. You know, you had this, so you started your independent brokerage, very real estate, and then you decided to partner. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit with compass because compass allows you to keep your company, keep your brand, keep your processes, like the way you want to run it. Like talk about that experience. Like how was that? Yeah. So, um, probably similar to you, right? When you're an independent and you're, you're successful, you're being recruited all the time, all the time, all the time. And, um, I took every meeting because why not? I think mm -hmm. it's important to have relationships with people and develop them and hear what they have to say and all of those things, but nothing was the right fit for me or where I was at that stage of my business. Um, and then compass came to the Philadelphia market and I was referred to their recruiting team uh, by an agent who I respect very much. And so of course I took the meeting and I was skeptical. I really was because it's it was so new at that time, right? I was agent 300 at wow. Compass in Philadelphia. I think they're up to 4,500 now. I was wow. the first independent brokerage to partner with them in the wow. region. And how many, how, how many interviews maybe, or how many of those conversations did you have prior to that? It took them four, I think it was a four month process to bring me on oh. board. And no, no, I no, no, I mean, you're talking about other brokerages. Uh, yeah, I'm talking oh, about other, other people How many trying I to get Liz. Right. Like 10. Five, at least five. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. at least five. You know, you think of how many brokerages are in Philly. Yep. Um, right. At least five, maybe more. I got very close with another large um, independent brokerage and really was, was thinking of going that path and ultimately pulled back from it. So there, there have been so many conversations. Yeah. I had heard so yeah. many pitches yeah. and I respect it. And I'm still really, you know, close with all of the leads, you know, like Tim and I know each other, right? Like all of the leads of these other companies, I think it's so important that you have relationships across the board. Totally. Um, but the compass, I, I teased my recruiter at compass. I'm like, was I the hardest one you ever recruited? He's like, <laughs> you went kicking and yeah. screaming. No, he literally was like, Elizabeth, I'm going to tell you a story. He said, I was in the car with my <sighs> wife and you and your team, like I hadn't signed everything yet, but my team was like set to onboard that Monday. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was like a Saturday and I don't remember any of this, but it yeah. was a Saturday. And he goes, and I got an email from you while I was in the car with my wife. And I just went like, oh my God, this is all over. She's not going to show up it's on Monday. It's crumbling in front of I us. It's it. not I was happen. at the one yard line and you know what? Yeah, we fumbled like, it so in the end zone close. and the game's over. We lost. <laughs> but I share that with you because 
you know, as a business owner, when you create something that is truly an independent, any business that you're creating is yours. Like you yep. take it on and you love it. And it's like a child in it many is. ways, right? It's, and it's you grow like, it yeah. from infancy. It's hard to kind of give up that control. But ultimately, when I aligned myself with Compass, the idea of doing it, the idea behind doing it was I had taken, I felt at the time, and I still believe this to be true years later, that I had taken my independent as far as I could, yep. meaning there's only great, so much way to you put can it. do in the customer service realm, yep. in that experiential share. You have to then layer on the technology, which I know you guys build at Copper Hill. I didn't want to build that, yep. right? More so, I didn't want to maintain it. You know, yep. you make the investment, but then you have to hire somebody to keep it going. And so by aligning with Compass, it really opened me up and my brokerage up to so many new opportunities. Yeah, it's like a whole new world. And it was. Re really what you were just talking about, I've I've used that same analogy that like the business, when you, you, you have a business, when you start a business, it's your baby. Mm -hmm. And your job is to make sure, just like with children, we're all parents, that the baby is healthy, that the mm -hmm. baby has what it needs. And that is round the clock. It never stops. It's nighttime. It's morning time. It's afternoon. Wait, it's... you can't like take a month or two off? Well, I mean, you have three. So I have one and she's got two. So we got a nice little, we got a nice little spread here. Yeah. You know, we got different perspectives. Right. But um, you saying that really hit home with me because mm -hmm. I think what goes through our minds, like Sean still running an independent uh, insurance brokerage. I think what goes through your mind when you have a conversation with a compass you know, mine, mine just happened more through something happening in my partnership. You know, I had to make a different move. It was just where I was. But having a conversation with Compass, I've had many conversations. It almost feels like I don't want to sell out. Like, I don't want to give up. Like, I've been doing this. I work at it. Like, I slave for this company, just like you do with your children. You're not going to give up on your kids. So as soon as someone comes around and says why don't you come over here? Because we can do this. It's very hard to wrap your mind around that. Now, what I will say, I've only been running my own team at a new spot um, for about five weeks. And Congrats. I thank you. <laughs> and you I ran one month and I ran a brokerage for almost 10 years. Um, I would agree. You know, you having your coaching business, probably many doors get opened because you have, you're such a good networker. You're a very good real estate agent. You're a very smart woman. You're successful. So you meet someone, they're like, I want you to talk to Sally, or I want you to talk to Beth, or I want you to talk to Jen. And I think they could benefit from what you're doing. And guess what? You both work at Compass or like, you, it doesn't even matter if you're at Compass or not. It, it mm -hmm. probably has opened doors. And what I have seen in about a month is that even this podcast, like when I was telling Sean about me having to change my business, I was like, I think this is going to be really good the podcast because now I have a platform of 20,000 agents, you know, in sure. Canada and the U S and like, yeah. it's collaborative and like people always want to learn, like in real estate, just like insurance, we're always learning. We're always absorbing information, podcasts and shows and books and blogs and news to, to get better at what mm -hmm. we do. And I think you just going through all that, like you had, you got to a point where you're just like, I feel like this is going to make very real estate much more successful. And it has, I've watched it. How long ago was it that has. again? You know, how many uh, years? I'm sorry. How many years I ago was it? that? Yeah. Five. So, yeah. So you had that whole run with your brokerage. You've been doing this for five years and look at you, look at what you're doing. Yeah. It's great. Well, you know, I think a lot of, um, I hear what you're saying. Like, you know, you feel like, oh, I'm giving it up. I'm doing yeah. all these things. And when I stepped back, because I had all those same thoughts, when I stepped back and thought about it, I was like, check your ego yep. at the door. Great advice. Because the reality Great is advice. like, I can still service my clients at a high level. I yep. can still be a mentor and a coach to my team. I now have all these opportunities that will open to me so that I can help in that spirit and that vein of helping others. I went to Compass and then I joined the agent advisory council. Okay. So I was able to lead in other ways, right? I've now been doing presentations at Compass in other ways I can show up. And I'm glad that I was able to kind of see that bigger picture because I think a lot of those earlier recruiting meetings, I didn't see it. Yeah. That's such wonderful advice. I love that. 
Hey everyone, this is Tim, your favorite Bricks and Risk co-host, but don't tell Sean. I hope you're enjoying this episode and I'll get right back to it in a moment. Our audience grows through word of mouth. So if you would please take a moment of your time and give us a review on the platform you're on, that would be fantastic. Please also help spread the BNR word by sharing your favorite episode with a friend. We greatly appreciate your time and trust. Now, back to the show. So let's stay on the topic of, of real estate. So you manage and coach a, a team, around 10 people or so the last, last time we spoke. Um, you focus most of your time on like the business development, the client service, the, the coaching. Um, so you used to sell technically full-time, right? You were full-time real estate agent while you were building your brokerage. Mm-hmm. Same deal. Talk about the team today. Like what's, what's the structure like, you know, mm-hmm. again, you're, you're in Washington, DC, your teams, mm-hmm. your teams in Philadelphia, but yep. be done. I know sure. people across the world running teams in Philadelphia, people live in Europe and it's, it's hard to mm-hmm. believe, but talk about that a little bit. How's that been working out? Yeah. So I think COVID has a lot of, um, a lot of play into how this worked, right? My team and I always met in person on Mondays Okay. in our office. We had a pipeline meeting every Monday at 10 o'clock when COVID hit, we took that meeting to zoom. And from there, we actually added a Friday meeting because remember, nobody was doing anything. There was nothing that was going on. We weren't allowed to legally work. So we added a Friday meeting where we would check in with one another on Fridays and we would all, I asked everybody to come with a quote, a quote that was inspiring to them at that moment. And I could see who was feeling really down, right? And then we would just talk, we would talk through challenges. And this is where like my coaching, my group coaching model probably started to play out for what eventually became the confident agent four years ago or four years later. So we got really good at meeting virtually because we had to, number one. It was awkward in the beginning, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, we literally had gotten a Zoom account at the end of 2019, like yeah. we never, what did you need Zoom for? Like, yeah. thankfully we had it when things went down in, you know, in March of 20. Mm-hmm. But I share this with you because if you have in your business, a culture, culture transcends sitting at the same table. Okay. Culture and our culture is so rooted in care for one another that it has been made all the difference in letting this team work. I mean, before I moved to Washington, DC, my husband was in Norfolk, Virginia. So we were there too. So we have been living in other places for, you know, quite a few years now. Um, So that was the first thing. The second thing was as my team grew, we were based in center city, Philadelphia. Our geographical expanse now is from South Jersey to Paoli. So people don't want to come to the center city office and park. Like they don't even want to be in person. So we get together in person maybe once a quarter just because it's nice to have that. Um, So that has really, really helped. But also I'm still in Philadelphia. I'm an Amtrak right away. So I'm in Philly every other week at a minimum. Sometimes at least once a week where I'll go up, see clients, do whatever I need to do and come back. Awesome. And that's the beauty of, you know being on the East coast makes it very easy. Well, I think it's culture, right? So culture culture drives everything and it really doesn't matter. You know, there, there, there's no set in stone. Like if you want good culture, you're going to need to meet in person, you know, it's got to be natural, authentic, got to speak, but what it's what fits for your team, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've talked about it before. It's like, You've said that you've polled your agents. And yeah, tried we surveyed f- them every year. Right. That's like four years we were in business, we sent a survey every year. What do we want? What do we like? How do we, you know, meet them where they are, where they want to be? And I think that just speaks to what you have going on, Liz, is you're building great culture. And it, the other stuff, it doesn't matter, mm-hmm. you know, where or how you do it. It's like you have a team that's close-knit that works together and it just happens to be a a virtual, you know, community that way. Yeah. I mean, I've never had somebody say to me, I need to meet more. Yeah. I'm leaving the team because you live somewhere else. It's like, Liz, Liz, where the hell are you? I need to drink some coffee. Can you just meet me? Like what's going on? 
Like this Doom stuff, nah, not flying. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. It doesn't happen. It doesn't. Yeah. No, it doesn't. and it's uh. It's well, I talked to you too. Remember, I mentioned Teresa, who's down in Texas, yeah, yeah. and she has an insurance office, and she uh, went completely virtual, mm -hmm. even after COVID. After COVID, that this is how she operates today, which is for an insurance office is like, like what yeah. are you doing? Can't do that. And Teresa's like, no, this is this is how we do it, and we are going to ensure that our culture kind of drives our office. Mm -hmm. And what they've done is. They open up like an open Zoom all day around the clock. So like... I would just knock and then say, hey, I need you. Yeah. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, Tim. Yo, I have a question. Do you have two seconds? And then you're both on the screen. You're like, what? What do you need? And that's the that's, one thing that cool. she's implemented to kind of like make the virtual work for her and the culture of her office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, that's super interesting. Um, all right. So... We have a questionnaire that we send out prior to doing the interview. And one of the questions is like, what do you love most about business? So um, one thing you shared is said, entrepreneurs have the unique ability to affect change every day if they are brave enough to do it. And you said, I love that my business exists to help others. So mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. Like why, why did that stand out when we asked you that question? Yeah, I mean, I've always approached what I do in the vein of service to others. How can I be of service to you and lend you my expertise and my experiences? And by leading with that, helping others, it has opened so many doors to me. And I think that that is not part of our industry all the time. You're I don't right. know if you agree. No, I you agree. Know, people, yeah, it's not. It's not like that. Yeah. And when I say like, be brave enough to do it, be brave enough to stand up for something that you believe in. And it might be against the grain of what is typical, but you will attract the people to you that will be the lasting relationships. Yep. And that I think is, is the difference. I think so, you know, I teach confidence, right? I think so many people are like, well, I can't do that because that's not how it's done. And it's like, well, really? Why can't you just do it a little differently? Because you believe and you feel aligned. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because again, I'm going to go back until when we got started and we're starting our brokerages and the culture was not like that at all. Very deal focused. And I don't ever want to like categorize, well, you're, you're a deal transactional agent or you're like a relationship agent. Like you can be both, but I will say that most of what I learned on the street, which again, most of the deals we do nine out of 10, 95 out of a hundred, maybe even more, you're going to cooperate with another mm -hmm. agent. And there's many times I'm sure you've experienced where again, we're cut from the same cloth. We're taking care of people smooth ride, giving them everything they need, setting their expectations, answering their questions, saying, I don't know when we don't know, because that's perfectly okay. And then we go to, we go to closing, like an in-person closing, which we did prior to COVID and don't do as much, but um, you go to the in-person closing and everyone will be there. The title company, the mortgage person, the buy side, the sell side, all the people, sometimes a couple family members. And I've been to a bunch of closings where they are arguing on the other side. Like they're like going through the paperwork. Like what, what, what's this? What does this mean? You, you didn't tell me about that. I've had, I, there's this one closing and I, obviously I'm not going to mention any names, but I remember being at the closing and we get there and they were like so pissed off from like the final walkthrough, which they already, they already negotiated that. They already had a report. Like it is what it said. It's done. It was like, well, I didn't tell them about that. I was like, not my problem. You know, I have my client, I'm protecting them. Your job is to protect yours. I remember they left the closing room like four or five times to close the door to go into another conference room and all you heard was yelling. And I'm like, wow. And, and do you know what was interesting? That agent wasn't new. And unfortunately, like you'll even see paintings from like back in the day and it's called like the business meeting or the real estate deal. And there's like people like yelling like across the table. I didn't I know agree that to that. You know what I'm closing. talking about? Yeah, the so closing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and that's, that's the way it was. It was a very like litigious, aggressive, competitive sport, real estate. And what's happened over the years is like, 
if you do it the opposite, like you said, if you look at this as like, you know what? We can put out most fires before they happen. Like we can fireproof anything. I can introduce you to anyone you want to be introduced to to learn more about the home, about the mortgage, about the legalities. Mm -hmm. And then it's so funny, like every now and again, you know, we run, we run teams and brokerages and someone will come to us be like, hey, you know, this client's like coming to me and they're like, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't like this. We need to talk to an attorney. What do we say? We're like, okay, here's, here's a couple attorneys. You know, talk I, to an attorney. I think yeah. they should talk to an attorney. Like we can talk about the agreement all day or the experience all day, the process. But when they're at a certain point, you have to be like, I really, you're going to have to go spend a couple hundred dollars, depending on the attorney and the conversation to go figure out what is best for you. And, and we do that. But like back when we first started, it was like, people would like, curse and yell and unprofessionalism and it still happens today people thrive on I'll that i'll share a story with you that um, please do i use a lot in my coaching um so when i came from new york i came back to philadelphia in 2013 which is my hometown i grew up in south jersey and i was brand new to selling residential real estate i had bought and sold commercial buildings but i had never sold a house when i started my business and I had a client who was a buyer coming down from New York and they were planning to look at condos that weekend. So on Thursday or so, they were coming down on Saturday, on Thursday or so, I requested a bunch of broker tours of the properties I thought I was going to see, you know, to show to them. Yeah. Because in my mind, in order to sell something well, I needed to know the property before I showed it to my client. Yep. Made sense to me at the time. Sure. Like an agent preview, they would call it. Agent preview. So I remember I got a very irate call <laughs> from a listing agent who was very experienced. And I wasn't. I mean, I was experiencing commercial real estate, but I really had never sold a house. And he said to me, um, I saw this request come through for an agent preview. Why are you doing that? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I'm show. you know, I think it's going to work for my client to show them on Saturday, but I'm not really sure. So I'd like to see it myself. And he ripped me apart, Whoa. ripped me apart and said, who do you think you are looking at this property, inconveniencing my seller wow. so that you can just come through yourself? And I got in my head about it. Yeah. He agreed like, to let me do it. You're like, so did I? Went I? To, did you did ask I? him if he wanted to sell the property? <laughs> I mean, like, seriously, what well, in the world? Wow. I did say to him to that point, I said, well, listen, if I don't know where the washer dryer is, and I can't show that to my client. Don't you think that's going to affect their opinion of the property? And he was like, okay, I guess that makes sense. Right. <laughs> so we finally like kind of came around, approved the preview. Yeah. But I got in my head about it. And this is the confidence, right? I got in my head about it. And I was like, oh my God, like maybe I am not doing this right. Maybe yeah. I shouldn't be selling residential. Like who am I to actually do this? I don't know what the process is in Philly. And Oh, uh, and I just spiraled, right? As we can do, you know, you're spiraling. Well, there's seeds of Maybe. doubt. Like this guy's so the, many seeds of this doubt. is the experienced guy. They he know. knows what he's know. doing. I, do I know what I'm doing? Maybe I shouldn't be asking this. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. That, yes. That's like, yeah, I totally see that. That's it. And I remember after I went to the preview, which was in Old City, I went to the Starbucks in Old City on 3rd and, um, and Arch. Mm -hmm. And I sat down, I had a cup of coffee and I pulled out my notebook. And I was so in my head, I made a note that said, what you can do that nobody else can. And I wrote all the things that I thought were going to make me successful in real estate, right? I found this and I read it every day. Every day that I had doubt, Good I went you. and read this That's note. awesome. I found that notebook about a year ago when I started doing this coaching and I was like, Oh my gosh. Wow. That's all the women in your community. That's the, the new, the so new agents. An, yep. This is all the stuff that they're yeah. dealing with. This oh, is that's the, phenomenal. I love that. So that's an exercise I do in my coaching. And when I do speaking engagements, I ask the women, it's usually women in the group to take, I give a note card out and I say, all right, I'm going to time you for two minutes. I want you to write down what makes you unique in this business Nobody other than you is going to see this. So don't be afraid to put all of the things on it. And then after that, we do the exercise of like that note card needs to sit in your handbag. And on the days that you have self-doubt, I want you to read it. And that note card needs to be what leads to your personal brand. Yeah, do it's not your North be Star. what everybody, yeah, so don't cool. be what everybody else is yeah. on Instagram. 
yeah. because you know Love this it. is what we do in the industry be who you are and what brings you that unique ability to serve your clients and then elevate that Great and put that in everything that you do it's awesome yeah i remember um uh, just, you know, training agents over the years, I'd use the word like a mentoring agents, like I'm mentoring mm -hmm. them. And someone had put it to me one way was when you mentor someone, you're kind of like telling them what you think they should do or what you think is best for them, which can be helpful. But a good coach will ask enough questions without saying a word about what they should do until the person being coached comes up with the answer that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when the person told me that, I was like, wow, that's really impactful because again, you know, when we run teams, you know, we had decent sized brokerages. It's like people are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. You're like, yeah, I think you should do this. Just go do that. I think you should say that. And we, a lot of times because we're so busy ourselves, we would never take, like we're running a business. You know, we just, mm -hmm. we never would, sometimes we wouldn't take the time to be like, well, well why do you want to know? Or like, how did that come up? Like, who said that? Like, where did you hear that? And then even when they say something, it's like, don't jump down their throat just yet. Just ask another question to like, and the, the good coaches of the world will always find a way to drag the information out of you that you're searching for but you're either too new or too busy or just too inexperienced to really understand what you even need to know. So, well, there also probably one little aspect of that too is probably also finding the motivation. Like, what totally. what's going to motivate this person? You know, yep. how how can we get the most out of this agent? Yeah, probably part. I call it Love approaching that. everything with a curious mind. Right. That's a great way. So, to put it. asking questions because you're curious. And really drilling down to a question with another question with another question to get to really what's the crux of the issue. And that's coaching. But I also coach the women to coach their clients yeah. in the sense oh, that yeah. you, know, you can go into a listing presentation, you can tell them 25 reasons that you're the best for this listing, right. or you can go into a listing presentation and you can approach it with a curious mind. And what, really get to the crux of why they're selling. Yeah, what really are you get looking to that for? Understanding. Why are you selling? Yeah. Like the why, right? Yeah. Why Just, am I here? Like, what do you want? Like, what's your timeline? Like, mm -hmm. what, what's important to you? What's you a know? win look like? It's not always about dollars. Yeah. You know? um, oh, that's awesome. Because uh, you'll ultimately have more clients and more dollars, right? If true. you approach it from this experience. Totally I think. agree. I mean, that's, been my, that's been my experience. I love it. <laughs> um, so another question we asked, it's like, you know, share, share a tip with our listeners and watchers. Um, one thing you had said is mindset is everything as a business owner. Becoming a mental warrior is the make or break of long-term success. Talk about that a little bit in mindset. Oh, yeah. Um, so we're in a unique position as entrepreneurs, right? Yep. Where we have to show up every day. We just show up every day. I remember when I was a W-2 employee in my 20s, I'd go out sometimes, you know, on a Thursday night, and then I'd go into the office on Friday. Right. And, and I would kind of, yeah, you don't feel great, right? So you're not like, you know, because you're tired or, you mail or it whatever, in. in the blank. <laughs> you're mailing it in. You're checking the box. You're still getting that paycheck every yep. two weeks, right? It doesn't matter if you're feeling great or you're not. Whereas an entrepreneur, and that's fine if that's the career path that you're on. But when you're an entrepreneur, the way that you, you have to show up every day. Yeah. And how do you show up your best by feeling good about yourself, by having that confidence, by having that feeling of like, I can do anything. So working on your mindset to me is mission critical in everything that we do. I'll share a story. When interest rates started spiking, what? 20, somebody, a lender recently. End of 22. A lender told me recently, and I was like shocked. She said, you know, we're in month 29 of interest rates rising. Like, 29? Oof. My God. Okay. Yeah. But if you were going to take you back to like June of 22, yep. that's when they really, two years ago, when they right. really went they high. They really took and off. Yep. It was wild because if you remember, there was probably a six month period where nobody really knew what to do. Yeah, there because was. Yep. There was because it was sort of this thing of like, are the rates going to come down? I'm thinking about buying. Maybe I shouldn't buy. I don't know. Right. And then sellers were sort of panicking. Like, well, is the value still there if the rates are higher? And well, so they, it, like, they were low for so down. long, you know, because so they were long. low for so long, 
That's yeah, that June to like December, people are like, what? Like what's going to happen? Sure. Should I just wait? And I was in the office one day at, at Compass. I was in the office and I'm looking around. I'm sitting in my office. And if you've been in the Compass offices, they're all glass, right? Yeah. So you can see what's going on all around you, even when you're in your office. So I'm in my office and I'm observing, it's really quiet on the floor. And I'm observing that people are kind of walking a little downtrodden, right? People are feeling this pressure. And I thought about myself as a leader, right? And I thought, what is the one thing that I can control right now? Because I cannot control what's going to happen with these interest rates. Right. I cannot control, you know, what's going to go on with people's decision making as a result of this. But I can control the way I show up for myself, I show up for my clients, and I lead my team. Awesome. And I leaned really hard into mindset, really hard. And it became one of those things where I think it was the differentiator that my team needed to keep going at a time that was fully uncertain mm -hmm. and people were starting to leave the industry. And so by leaning into mindset, it allowed me to feel better about things I couldn't control oh, because great. I knew I could control what was going on in my head. Oh, attitude, you yeah. know? It's totally. what, what is your attitude? If, if your attitude is your, oh, this stinks. I can't yeah. do anything. Like mm -hmm. you're not going to accomplish anything. You're not going to do anything. If, you're, if your good. mindset is, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to this. I'm going to, you know, move forward and yeah. win. There's a good chance that'll happen. Totally agree. I have a phrase in my coaching business called um, celebrate the wins. Celebrate the wins. Yeah. And every time I meet for group coaching, I have the women in, in the cohorts share the wins. What, and it, sometimes when you have a really bad week, it's hard to find those wins. Yeah. Totally. But Liz, by forcing them to do that, it takes them to a higher level. In my office, we have, we operate on teams. So like all the communication mm -hmm. is teams. Of course you do. We have a, a <laughs> sub channel that's wins because insurance, nice. now, insurance now stinks. Yeah. It's, sure. it's rotten. It's hard. And so I'm like, we gotta, we gotta celebrate yeah. anything, anything positive, the littlest bit of thing that is a win. That's not negative, you know? Yeah. And we post them out there and there's like GIFs it. on there and there's like comments <laughs> yeah. and follow-ups. And it's, it's like, it takes you out of that, like downtrodden, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like a micro escape out yes. of, Oh, this environment that's totally. like, Hey, yeah, it's bad. But like, Hey, look what I did over here. That's right. And really being able to recognize them, even if they're super tiny, they Doesn't build matter. momentum. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. No, there's a difference between being a martyr and a warrior. And, you know, sometimes it's okay to feel bad about certain things. You know, everyone's got to release emotions. Like you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to bottle things up, but if you let it drive what you're trying to do, it's not going to go the way you want it to. And we also have a whiteboard at my office that is for F's. So every time that an F comes out, we, we sometimes put it on a board because at that point you need a release and it kind of makes it funny. <laughs> like, okay, what, put another one on the board. All right. So mm -hmm. too many today. We got to chill out. Have fun with it sometimes. Nice. We call it um, sitting in your poopy diaper. <laughs> you know, we all have kids. You can That's understand great. that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can sit in your poopy diaper and complain and cry and all the stuff, or you can change your situation, right? It. So it's okay it's to sit analogy. there for a minute, but don't sit there for a long time. Yep. Oh, good. All right, so the last one is that we also asked for a quote. Your quote was, go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you've imagined by Henry Thoreau. Why was that the quote that you thought was a good fit? Because I truly believe, because I've done it and I've coached people to do it, that you can design your life in whatever way you want and you deserve to have the life that you want. And the critical piece of that is the confidence. And that little quote I had, I bought when I lived in New York City, you know, like when you're checking out and they have those like little magnets at yeah. bed, I think it's Whole Foods. Put it on yeah. the fridge or something. That magnet, I was in the checkout line in New York and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Let me grab this. And it sat on my whiteboard for years, awesome. for years. And when I think about that, I'm like, wow, I was laying a foundation 10 years ago. I didn't even know that I would end up on that trajectory. Yeah. Oh, so thank great. you. Whole Foods. 
Thank you, Whole Foods. Jeez. All the little gems at checkout. That's yeah. right. Well, hey, can't thank you enough for your time today, Liz. Um, Thanks we, for having me. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah, this we is we awesome. know you're, thank a, you. you're a busy, successful businesswoman, business owner, coach, and a mother and a wife. So all those take time. Navy wife. Navy wife. Um, if you don't mind, why don't you share with our listeners and viewers how they can learn more about you, the confident agent, your sure. team, everything you got going on. Yeah, so I live on Instagram at elizabeth.convery. Um, you can DM me to join a newsletter. I write a newsletter twice a week. Uh, it's weekly, you know, bi-weekly, uh, tw two times a week, excuse me, tips for women in real estate called the Toolkit for Confident Agents. So um, joining my newsletter is a great way to stay connected, not only to get the tips, but also to learn more about the programs. I do a lot of webinars, do a lot of uh, events. And so that's a great way to stay connected. Fantastic. There's a girl Fantastic. that we grew up with that does, she was a mortgage broker. She's in Colorado. Okay. Um, and she does uh, kind of a similar group, I think, for women uh, out there. And nice. it's, uh, I think it's pursuing freedom and like how to work with. Um, Might be a good connection for Liz. Yeah. Awesome. I linked that up. We'll yeah, have to I'd check love to that connect out. with her. Great. Well, that's all we have for this one, folks. So thank you for tuning in again to another episode of Bricks and Risk. See you soon. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Bricks and Risk. Our goal is that you walk away with one or two valuable nuggets, and we greatly appreciate you sharing your time with us today. You can find all BNR episodes on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and anywhere else you get your podcast content. Until next time, keep learning and keep growing.